friends, in beginning this second chapter of our book of Principles of Reckoning, titled Three Steps in Reckoning, there's some things I want to share with you about our meeting together. I do trust that you won't be disappointed or feel frustrated in not receiving too much at a time. I trust you won't feel that your time is being wasted in these little studies together because <clears throat> actually I don't want to help you too much and I may be helping you too much when you don't even though you don't realize that uh, when we hold meetings in homes for hungry Christians we seek to meet every other week at the most as far as timing goes and usually have the meetings go about for about two years usually break up for a mo couple of months in the summertime but actually we don't meet more than oh probably 20 times 25 times sometimes folks can't make a meeting and all but anyway the design of the meetings is to establish certain truths in the Christian's thinking to uh, enable him to see them in the word clearly and then we want them to be on their own with the Lord as soon as possible that they might not lean upon us, might not lean upon any leader, but that they might learn to rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the source of all growth. So that the meetings are designed to this end. If it takes three meetings or thirty. But not to go on indefinitely, not give the individual an opportunity to learn to lean upon the leader and uh, depend upon each meeting for what they need throughout the week or weeks. Uh, we don't want that. We want to avoid that. That each one of you becomes an established Christian in the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, learns about Him and learns about the Word. Uh, not only that uh, your own Christian life might function uh, in a stable way and grow, but that you might be one who in turn can assist other Christians who are hungry to grow and that you're having learned how to depend upon the Lord you're not going to let this these other contacts that the Lord gives you you're not going to let them lean upon you you're not going to cripple uh, cripple them up by letting them lean upon an individual even if it is you no that you in turn will realize having learned to lean upon the Lord Jesus for yourself, that you will realize the importance of teaching them the same thing. And that's the only way we're going to have stable, mature Christians who can become fruitful, that the truths of growth will multiply. That's the greatest need we have amongst Christians today always has been that the Christian becomes stable and mature, that he can stand, that he's one who can share effectively. That's what the world needs to see. That's what the church needs to exist and flourish. Mature Christians, Christians who are established in the Lord Jesus Christ, not established in any line of belief, not established in the church, as such, uh, or any movement, but established in the Lord Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, Christian who is living in heaven right today, but that he's functioning upon earth. <clears throat> well, now, this title of the chapter 2 is Three Steps in Reckoning. And in our chapter 1, we touched on three or four different points 
about the necessity for knowledge of the word and then our faith is based upon the truth that we know and then we give God time to work these truths out in our lives and that we learn to value our needs and realize wh why we do have needs that we might be find them met in the Lord Jesus in God's own way and time. Well, there seems to be quite a few points required. Well, don't let this bother you one bit. Because each one of these little points may seem to be like an individual point at first, but they all blend. They all blend into a working whole as we move along carefully. Probably one of the, the reasons for so much failure amongst uh, Christians and in our churches today is that things are too general. A Christian has a, an overall idea about the Christian life, but he's not specific enough. He, he doesn't get down to where things work. And we are seeking to bring out principles and points and specific truths that are geared to specific needs. Nothing general. Everything is specific. As specific as we can discover in the Word. Well, it works the same if you're a housewife and a mother. Incidentally, there's no greater ministry in all the Christian realm than being a Christian mother, Christian housewife, Christian wife, and uh, many mothers are upset and champing at the bit, so to speak. Their husband may be quite active for the Lord. And they feel that they're tied to the kitchen sink and uh, raising children and all. But that that's a ministry that uh, is second to none. That God is keeping you there to raise these children and to provide a home for your husband and place for yourself to grow and uh, that's where God has you true uh, when the children uh, kiddies are grown and the children are away at college or married and, and gone then uh, all of this experience and all of this faithfulness on your part and all of this study uh, will begin to really culminate in uh, the new freedom that you have where you, the Lord may move you out into uh, a ministry that is out of the home or using the home but it has freedom to move about and it's worth waiting for and all that you go through in the years up to that time are preparation for that time and the Christian life often begins at 42 as well as our worldly saying that life begins at 40 but faithfulness where we are is what counts. And God is looking far ahead. And if we are growing now, that growth will accrue to a very fruitful ministry later on. And it's also producing a fruitful ministry even now in the faithful managing of a Christian home. So take heart. Well, with speaking of these different points. Now, in uh, golf, for instance, maybe most of you know little or nothing about golf, but it's a good, uh, it's a good illustration that there are a thousand and one things to be learned in a simple golf swing. Very extremely technical, have rigid laws about them, about balance and pivoting and stiff certain arms uh, to be held stiff and certain wrists to be cocked at a certain time and uh, certain things to do with your head and your eyes and every muscle in your body all have to be perfectly coordinated and it takes years and years of concentrating on the individual specific points and of course some so-called golfers never learn half of these points and never amount to anything except that they can go out and get some exercise and blow off some steam. That's what their golf game does for them. 
but the point is that <clears throat> as these individual points are mastered through daily exercise and daily seeking to understand them, the time comes when the golfer stands before that tiny ball with a golf club correctly gripped in his fingers, which is every finger and every muscle in the hand has to be just so. I hope this isn't discouraging you from taking up golf, but it's a fact. I, I, I spent uh, probably 20 years of my life in golf. Extremely technical, but as these points are mastered little point by little point, there comes a day when you stand before the ball and you get up there and swing, send the ball down the fairway, and you haven't thought at all about any one of the key points. It has become a rhythmic, normal flow that all of these points are working together. And you don't think about these childish things of stance and fingers and feet and head. You concentrate upon where you're going to place that ball. Well, it's the same in everything. It's the same in the kitchen. My, how one struggles those first years in the kitchen. Not only how to do uh, this and that, but where is this and that to do it with? And you're seeking around your cupboards. You don't have things placed exactly uh, where they, you want them to be. And it takes years. It takes years, as you well know, to organize your kitchen and organize your thinking and your system and your recipes where uh, finally you... Uh, you automatically set your things up and you make that pie crust, that flaky pie crust that you struggled for many years prior to the time, but now you just simply know what to do and know how to do it and when to do it and what to use, and you have your flaky pie crust. And uh, the same with all your timing of getting food on the table hot, and then, then the big thing of getting the children the hungry children at the table when the food is placed on it, getting them in the house, getting them washed up, getting your husband away from what he's doing in the basement, and get them at the table when the food is timed. All quite a project, but after a number of years, it becomes not automatic, but uh, natural and normal. I speak a little bit... Uh, to some extent, uh, from what I know, because I happen to be the chef here in our home, and uh, I'm pretty backward and uh, amongst these in these things, and it's probably taken me 15 years to even begin to know what I'm doing in the kitchen, and it takes that much for some of us. Uh, I think of uh, baseball. I used to be a ball player. I used to be a pitcher, a left-handed pitcher, you might know. And I worked and struggled on my own for many, many years. We didn't have any real coding. So the wheat in there. And there were many years of failure out there in the mound. All through high school, years later, but there came a time, after an awful lot of work and an awful lot of failure and an awful lot of beatings, there came a time when all of these intricate points of baseball pitching and ball playing began to fit together, where I didn't have to think of each thing. And there came a time where I knew where I was going to throw that ball and how I was going to throw that ball with hardly thinking about it. And there came a time when all the failure was wiped out and there was uh, winning ball games year after year. But uh, that never could have happened apart from the experience of the years of failure and uh, concentrating on the individual points where you finally have a flow, uh, a normal, natural, highly geared flow of thinking and acting that produces the end product. And whereas all of these things have to do with natural things, 
um, it's the same in our in a spiritual realm. That when we begin to get into these truths, they all seem separated and uh, have sharp edges, and they don't seem to synchronize. But as we stick with them, and our hunger drives us back and back to the Word and the Lord Jesus, and we learn to trust Him in prayer about these things, and don't take it for granted that, uh, well, if I study hard enough, I'll get it, but we have to be dependent, and we have to learn to look to Him in prayer along with our study, that we study prayerfully and expectantly, then the sharp edges seem to fade away and everything begins to flow. Well, that's why we have little meetings like this. That's why books like this are written, that these pieces can begin to fit together and that we, became, we become uh, ultimately become responsible, stable individuals in Christ. And as each one of us becomes mature, uh, the Lord Jesus gears us as members of his body, members one of another, and there is a natural, normal flow of Christian living all Christians more or less more and more fitting together. I'm not speaking about ecumenical things as we know them today, but I'm speaking about the body of the Lord Jesus Christ functioning. And he is a head, and he is the one who gears it all. But he doesn't gear Christians together until each Christian is geared, so to speak. That he is in rhythm with himself and he's in rhythm with the Lord then the Lord can merge him in an overall use an overall testimony of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ his body functioning in this world so don't be discouraged as we touch upon individual points because all of this is fitting together all of these things are working together for our individual development and our development as members in the body of Christ, our development as stones in the temple of the Lord, and uh, our part in his purpose for not only each one of us, but his purpose for the church, his body. So what we're seeing here in chapter 2 is that as we learn these truths, we must realize that we learn them from the Word of God. That's our source of knowledge. But that the truths for growth that we see in the Word of God are centered in the Son of God. And that the reason we have our authoritative Bible is that we might come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. That in coming to know him, we also come to know the Father. Now, a mistake we often make is that we seek to learn the truth in the Bible, but we don't learn it learn the truth in close fellowship with the one who said, I am the truth. We have the written word, which is the means of coming to know the living word. As we get to know the written word, as it was designed for our training, that will result in our coming to know the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ. We can't really get to know him if we avoid the word, if we don't 
trust the word as God's very word so that of course the Bible is indispensable it's our only source of coming to know him true that as we study the word God takes us through experiences and circumstances and situations that make that word all the more relevant and works the truth of that word into our daily life but we cannot get to know the truth simply by experience experience daily experience is simply a supplement to the written word of God we must ever keep these things in their right relationship the Bible comes first and foremost our father will regulate experience according as we come to know the truth from the word so that to gain the most benefit from our study in the word of God our hearts and our thinking must be in fellowship with the Lord Jesus as we study as we learn about him and of course our dependence is upon the spirit of truth the Holy Spirit who wrote the word and he of course being in touch with the author we depend upon him to reveal the word to us if we happen to be uh, of a brilliant turn of mind and uh, natural students then we must be careful about self seeking to learn about the word but God has uh, enabled us and caused us to be brilliant uh, maybe and uh, astute students not to depend upon this sure he'll use it but he must use it it must be under his control and there must be that attitude in our hearts well Lord if I happen to be this way it's because of thee not certainly nothing from me and then of course if we happen to be quite dull as students naturally if we're just that way never were students uh, much of a student then there's no question then then we're better off really because then we do have to depend upon the Lord and then course he can teach us and will teach us as we study in our slow plotting way maybe it's all very difficult for us but he will teach us regardless at least we'll be more dependent upon him or have a tendency to be to be more dependent upon him because of our condition I, I, I myself uh, never, never was a student. I didn't make, I remember fourth grade, I tried that twice, and then I finally got into fifth grade. High school was a complete debacle. Wheaton High, I, I just cringe every time I think of it, how... Uh, I didn't attend half the classes. Those dear teachers, how patient they were with me and how understanding. And uh, how, but how I ever got through high school, I'll never, I never know, I'll never know. I never, uh, as a student, I didn't get through at all. And I remember that in those days, I don't know about now, but back in those days, they used to give out some blank diplomas for one reason or another. Uh, in the graduation exercise there were always a few of them and I remember very definitely that I uh, when I was up there at graduation time I wasn't too sure whether or not I would receive I was receiving a signed diploma plus the fact that I that was my sixth year in high school sixth year two years behind my class I had quit high school in my junior year and uh, 
It was during the Depression, and I was floating about the country for a year. Finally came back to high school. But at any rate, certainly not a student. Certainly not. But you know, when the Lord saved me, as a poor, miserable drunkard, 27 years old, The day after I was saved, I became a student. No effort on my own part. Now, I had had no Sunday school or church background all through those years, but the day that God saved me, there was a hunger in my heart for the Word and a hunger to grow. And I got hold of a Bible, a very fine print little old Bible, I remember. And I got a hold of a red marking pencil. We didn't have ball pens in those days. And I was not working then, being just a drunk, living at home, breaking my parents' heart, hearts in it all. But I remember that from the day I was saved, almost for the entire following year, I studied that little Bible day and night, so to speak. I probably averaged 10 hours a day simply pouring over the Word of God. Actually, what the Lord was doing, it was, um, to a degree, catching me up from all the... Uh, I was catching up from all the Sunday school background that I had missed, all the church background, and uh, what one learns of the Word in Sunday school and in church. Not that I caught up in that one year, but uh, it gave me a foundation to begin to begin on. And I, I loved uh, and believed everything in the Word, and I remember that little Bible was almost, almost every line was marked with my red pencil. I, I, I marked everything I liked, and I liked everything. And I simply marked up that entire Bible. And uh, wild horses couldn't pull me away from that Bible during that first year. And I, after coming out of the service in 1945, five years after uh, being saved, after I was saved, I was studying constantly because I was hungry and needy. I was studying books like Newell's Romans, uh, studying some of the Andrew Murray books. And I have been in the Lord's work full-time since 1945, let's say. Even, yes. It's 1967 now, 22 years. I have carried on this correspondence work all through these years, full time. But, and I spend, I have spent for years, and I spend now about 12, 13 hours a day at the desk on an average day. The mail comes in. I'm at the desk a little after eight, maybe, and then I have to get the mail and uh, all, but really get going by 9.30, and I don't leave the desk until at least 10 o'clock at night. Of course, I leave it for lunch. Sometimes I even take a nap for an hour in the afternoon. But with all the correspondence and all, there is a great amount of study involved, even to this day. And I probably average, oh, I don't know, probably average four hours a day study, have for 22 years. And that's six days a week. And I, I shouldn't say this to you, but sometimes uh, on the Lord's Day I'm quite busy studying. But the thing is, you may have personal traits built in, and you may not, but whatever the Lord intends to do with you, he'll do it. 
whether he uses natural traits or whether he doesn't. I think most often he uses natural traits. If we'll let him use them, and if we'll stop using them for him, he'll use them. And if, uh, even so, <coughs> in my own case, I may have been a student all along, but just a little too wild and uh, uninterested, uninterested in my unsaved days. Uh, maybe they handled me wrong in school. Maybe they gave me too much freedom. I don't know what it was. But I certainly never studied through school. I don't know how I got through. And true, during my drunken days, after high school and all, all through those years of, uh, of just uh, not amounting to anything, not getting anywhere, I, I was quite a reader. I hate to tell you what I read, but I would read, oh, probably averaged at least two books a week, novels, books that were coming out in those days, probably at least a hundred books a year. So there was an, an ingrained uh, propensity for reading and studying at that. But then, of course, when I got saved, the Lord began to gear all of that. I often think of um, Charles Wesley, who was a sort of a poet before he got saved. He, he used to live in a, in a garret trying to write poetry. For, for years. And then when he got saved, of course, all of this uh, ingrained writing ability was uh, taken by the Lord and used. And uh, as you may know, Charles Wesley wrote 5,000 hymns during his Christian life. <clears throat> well, what we're saying is that pay attention to the points and they'll become a whole. And don't be discouraged about these different points. Uh, we look here on page 9. <clears throat> Up on top, the wonderful set of verses from Second uh, Peter 1. That um, God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Through the knowledge, you see, to know the Lord Jesus and to know our Father, that we've been called to glory and virtue, and uh, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these, these promises, these truths in the word, you might be partakers of the divine nature. And... If you, uh, you might think for a moment of uh, John 17, 3, that this is eternal life, that we might know God, know the Father and uh, the Lord Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Not know them just in, uh, know about them or know them in a mental way, but to get to know them in the word by the ministry of the Holy Spirit that we really come to know personally the Lord Jesus and our Father in heaven. And that this knowledge, this uh, relationship, this fellowship, this uh, feeding upon them and feeding upon the truth results in Christian life, results in Christian growth and maturity. We feed upon the source and there's going to be the result. And it isn't a matter of our struggling to grow and seeking to produce we simply pay attention to the one who who has already produced on our behalf. That our life is complete in the Lord Jesus, and he's already produced it in himself, and he is seeking to express it through us as we grow. Not I, but Christ. That's the whole principle. Pay attention to the source, and he'll, he'll carry out his responsibility of making himself real in and through us. 
<coughs> so that's why we have the Word of God. And it isn't a matter of studying the truths of identification and seeking to reckon just because the Word of God says so. It is, uh, we are to find these things out and to count upon these things in close fellowship with the Lord Jesus. The identification truths are actually liberating truths that we, the old life has been dealt with and that the new life is centered in the Lord Jesus. He is the new life. There's the two halves to the identification truths, the negative half of being freed from the, the power of sin and the power of self and the, the positive half of being established in the Lord Jesus, who is our life and our strength. The two halves. But all of it is in close relationship to the Lord Jesus. And we can't just uh, bypass Him and forget about Him and just study the Word and seek to rest these truths for our own benefit because the Holy Spirit is not going to minister the, uh, the truth on that basis. That's something to think about. The Holy Spirit, his entire ministry, is not only centered in the Word and the truth, but it's centered in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, his specific ministry is to give us the things of Christ. He is the Spirit of Christ. And if he is going to have freedom to carry his ministry out in our lives, it's me, it means that he's going to minister the Lord Jesus to us. And that's his one burden. That's his one purpose. That's why the Holy Spirit abides within our spirit. He brings the life of the Lord Jesus Christ in our spirit when we're born again. And now he's working to manifest that life through our lives, through our new life, our Christian life. Not through self, but through the life that he's recreated in us that we, as new creations in Christ, will be showing forth Christ in our daily walk. And then on page 9 here, down near the bottom, that we have this uh, term, erroneous expectation, that uh, we think, well, the minute we come to understand uh, the liberating truths, identification truths, that we are to be liberated uh, right away and freed from sin and self and uh, free to grow in Christ. And we expect it to happen right now because we're believing it right now. But we must believe it in fellowship with the Lord Jesus and that He is the liberator. He liberates, of course, through the Word on the basis of the truth of the Word. But the two go together, the written truth and the living truth. And that's what we must remember. Study the Word in fellowship with the Lord Jesus. And of course, that makes that will help our Bible study. That, that that's what makes Bible study real and precious, and uh, fruitful, and interesting, and vital, because we're reading the Word with Him, who is the Word. That's that'll make the great difference for many Christians. So now here on page ten, we have three points. The first point is to know the truth and count upon it. These truths of, for growth, these truths of our identification with the Lord Jesus. And point two, to abide and rest in our liberator. To abide in the Lord Jesus as we study the word. And to rest in him, to depend upon him, and to, to depend upon his spirit, the Holy Spirit. To minister these truths to us that we're studying. And then point three is depend upon and to walk in the Holy Spirit during the day. That as we study these truths and get to know more about them, we're depending upon the Holy Spirit to take us through things in our daily life, to make these truths real in us, to work them into our daily life. That takes experience, that takes uh, circumstances, it takes situations, it takes... Uh, our relationship to others. It takes all the facets of our everyday life and work. All these are required <coughs> and needed and used by the Holy Spirit to make real in our life the things that we're studying. 
the more we study about the Lord Jesus and get to know Him, the more He becomes real in our daily walk by the ministry of the Spirit of Christ. So we're enlarging here a bit on point one. And I think it might be good, as we uh, mentioned here, Romans 6, 1 to 10, if we take our Bibles and turn to that chapter, we might think for a few minutes together upon some of these verses. We'll do it again later on in, in chapters as we go along, but we cannot, we cannot see these things too clearly. And they're very obscure, they're very difficult at first, as you well know in your own study and as you know as you uh, seek to share these things with others, that they just cannot seem to understand them at first. And if they're not needy and ready, they never can understand them. Uh, many, many pastors, many uh, Christian workers, many, most Christians it seems, never do get anywhere near Romans 6. Many Christians don't even realize it's in their Bible. And uh, these truths never affect them, and they, they never uh, seem to see them. But the growing, hungry Christian finds that these truths are the very key to his Christian life, that it's uh, Christ who is our life. Now let's look for a moment at Romans 6, just uh, go through some of these verses together. First of all, there's something very important that we must realize about these early verses of Romans 6. And that is that they are setting forth what the Lord Jesus experienced in Calvary. And they're also setting forth the fact that we were identified with him at that time. Every Christian who would ever believe the Lord uh, God placed that Christian in the Lord Jesus at Calvary identified us, each of us, with him in what happened to him on the cross. <clears throat> Whereas the Lord Jesus actually experienced the death of the cross and the resurrection, it is not set forth here in Romans 6 as our experience. What it says of us here in Romans 6, here the Lord is speaking of what is true of us in Christ, what is true of us positionally, what is true of us judicially. It's the way God sees us. And he wants us to see ourselves here as the word, uh, the word sets forth the truth. But it is not something that we experienced it is a, a non-experiential truth about us set forth here in Romans 6. And the reason it is set forth is so that in time we can begin to experience these truths in our daily walk here and now. But as it is set forth here, it is non-experiential. Verse 3, Know ye not that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Well, we didn't experience that death, but we were taken down into his death. The Holy Spirit baptized us into Christ. As uh, This is speaking of a spiritual baptism, of our being placed in Christ, immersed in him, born into him, as in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit were we all baptized into one body. Speaking of our spiritual baptism, we were placed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And since we were placed into the Lord Jesus Christ, we experienced, we were given the benefit of what he experienced. We were baptized into his death. <clears throat> in verse 4, therefore we are buried with him, or we were buried with him by baptism into death that as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, even we also should walk in newness of life. Well, resurrection follows death. When the Lord Jesus Christ paid the penalty of our death, when he died for sin, he was free to rise up out of death, the penalty being paid. And in that his dying for sin paid the penalty of our sin. And since we were 
identified with the Lord Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, uh, we were free to rise in him. We shared his resurrection out of death. As Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. <clears throat> now this is the truth about us. When we experience our water baptism, immersion, we are testifying to these facts. We are giving a public testimony, a picture of what happened to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We go down into the waters of death. We're covered by those waters, signifying our death unto sin in Christ. We're uh, baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's showing our identification with him. And then we're raised up out of the water as a testimony to the fact that we are raised up out of death in the Lord Jesus Christ. And now our Christian life is hid with Christ in God. He is raised and we are raised. That's our position in the Lord Jesus. We think here of uh, verse 6. Very important. Key verse. Tremendous verse. But it needs some understanding. <clears throat> Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with the Lord Jesus, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Well, in the first place, we're to know that our old nature, our self-life, was crucified with the Lord Jesus, so that the body of sin might be rendered inoperative, not destroyed, not, uh, not taken away, Every, every growing Christian realizes very definitely that the self-life certainly wasn't destroyed. It's certainly active within his life. But it was rendered inoperative at Calvary, a finished work, so that the Christian would not have to serve sin, would not be under the dominion and the slavery of the power of sin in the self-life. And this is the finished fact. This is the truth. We first find out about the facts, the truth in these verses. And then as we find out the facts of what happened to us at Calvary, what happened to us in Christ, what God did with us, as we find that out, then God calls us to believe those facts. And through our faith, the Holy Spirit begins to give us the experience of these truths in our daily walk here and now. We begin to experience that which happened to us way back at Calvary. We begin to experience that which is already true of us now in the Lord Jesus. And uh, Paul sets forth here in uh, verses 7, 8, 9, and 10 more facts about the Lord Jesus that we're to, as we find out what happened to him, then we know what happened to us because we were identified with him. Verse 7, For he that is dead is freed from sin, freed from the power of sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Now, that's what happened to the Lord Jesus. Find out what happened to him. Realize we were identified with him. And then we know what happened to us. It's just that simple. That's why God can say what he does say in verse 11. This is a key verse for the Christian life. Uh, John 3, 16 is a key verse for the unsaved, actually. And this verse here, Romans 6, 11, is the, is the John, 16, John 3, 16 for the Christian. This is a key verse for Christian growth. Just as you might say that John 3.16 is a key verse for Christian birth. The reason Paul uses the word likewise here is because he just got through telling us what happened to the Lord Jesus. So he says, likewise, count ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, 
because the Lord Jesus died unto sin and we were in him when he died. And count ye also yourselves alive unto God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's where the Lord Jesus is. He's alive in God. And we, as Christians, our life is hid with Christ in God. As uh, in Colossians 3.3, 3, For ye died, and your life is now hid with Christ in God. That's where we are. That's our position. That's where the source of our life is, safely hidden in glory. And God wants us to see that. That becomes our set attitude. And as we uh, exercise faith in those facts, we, we, we begin to receive the benefit, the daily benefit of those facts. Well, first he gives us the truth, and he wants us to become established in that truth, to see it clear as day, and to know it, that it becomes our heart attitude, as we mentioned here on page 11 of our book. Our heart attitude becomes a uh, I have died unto sin, out of the realm of sin, and God has placed me in His Son. I'm alive unto God in Christ. That's my position. That's where I actually am. Well, as we become established in that truth, then begins the process of making that truth experiential here and now. And we think of Second uh, Corinthians 4.11, which is, uh, you might say, a uh, process verse. It, it, it pictures how God makes these things real in our walk, here and now. The things that happened to us way back at Calvary. Now this, this shouldn't be uh, really too hard for us because every one of us uh, realizes fully that we were born again uh, and our justification happened back at Calvary and we're, we're getting the benefit of that today. We began to get the benefit of that fact the instant we were saved. We knew we were saved, and we began to rejoice in the Lord, and we experienced the, the new life of the Lord Jesus Christ. We knew we were born again. Something that happened to us way back Calvary. Well, that was training. That was uh, getting us ready for the very same thing here. That way back at Calvary, God separated us from the power of sin, and he placed us in his risen Son. And now he's asking us to believe that. And as we believe it, he begins to give us the reality of it in our walk. <clears throat> Look here for a moment at Second Corinthians 4.11. For we which live are always delivered unto death. There's one of God's paradoxes. That he takes the Christian, the Christian is the only one in this world who's living. We alone have life. We are alive unto God, and the Christian actually is, positionally, the Christian is dead to the world, he's dead to sin, he's dead to Satan, he's dead to self, but he's alive unto God in Christ. That's what's true of us. Whereas the unsaved are dead to God, they're dead in trespasses and sins, they are alive unto the world, they're alive unto self, they're alive unto Satan, they're alive unto the law, it's just the opposite. The Christian's dead to these things and he's alive unto God. So the word says, we which live are always delivered unto death. Well, the hungry Christian, the Christian who is hungry to grow, the Christian who begins to see the truths of identification and begins to count upon them, God begins to take him down to death. Often this is the very opposite of what the Christian expects. He expects, well, since I've begun to, begun to uh, reckon upon my identification, now I'm going to be a victorious Christian and everything's going to be perfect. Uh, no, uh, there's a process, and the process is reversed. The process is that God takes us down to death because uh, out of death springs resurrection life, the life of the Lord Jesus. So that God uh, takes us through experiences and uh, circumstances and situations relationships that uh, crucify us, that bring us down, that make us nothing, that uh, hold the old life, the self-life, in the place of death, inoperative. And through that very difficult process, where we learn to hate our life and learn to uh, allow God to deal with it and allow the cross to crucify it and experience, uh, out of that springs life, 
the life of the Lord Jesus. And uh, the life of the Lord Jesus is made manifest in our body, in our mortal flesh. As we die unto sin and unto self and experience, why the Lord Jesus uh, blossoms forth. He's manifested. And that's the principle, that his life springs out of our death. And it's only uh, all of this process that's pictured in Second Corinthians 4.11 it's only the outworking of what already happened to us way back at Calvary. And we must remember that everything in our Christian life, all of these things that are working together for our good, they're all simply the outworking of what God has already done. Already done with us at Calvary and already done with us in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our life. And he pictures the... Uh, he gives us this picture on uh, page 11 also of the, the vine and the branch. And it's the same thing. That the Lord Jesus is the true vine, he's the source of our life, and that we're, we're branches in him. That's all we are, is a branch. And a branch does not have life of itself. The branch depends entirely upon the vine for its life and for its fruit. And since we are branches in the true vine, his, the life of that vine is manifested in us as branches. Whatever kind of vine it is, if it's a concord, uh, it's going to produce concord grapes. And those grapes are going to have all the characteristics of that vine. Uh, there's a law that uh, cannot be questioned. And it's exactly the same law that uh, works in our relationship to the Lord Jesus, who is the true vine. That the fruit of the Spirit is the life of the vine. And it is, uh, as we grow, it, that fruit is manifested in our lives. The love of the Lord Jesus Christ, the joy of the Lord Jesus Christ, the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ, my peace I give unto you. And as we grow, that vine is manifested in us as branches. And it behooves us to realize that we're nothing but branches. And a branch simply abides, simply rests where it's been placed. And we have been born again, born into the Lord Jesus. That's where we, God has placed us, in our risen Lord. And the roots of our vine are anchored in heaven. The roots are growing out of the throne of God. They're growing out of the, the life of God the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's our anchor. That's where our life is anchored. That's where our life comes from as we're down here in this lost, sin-sick, dark world. Our, the source of our life is in the light of glory. That we are in the light as to our source. And God wants us to see that. And of course, the branch certainly doesn't work to produce the fruit. The branch rests. And we can't. Uh, if we begin working, we're going to produce the fruit of self, the works of self. And uh, that's the very thing that we hate, the very thing that we want to avoid. We long in our hearts, our renewed hearts, our new life, uh, we hunger for the Lord Jesus. That's the hunger the Holy Spirit places within our hearts that will not be denied. And we fear and we hate the works of the flesh. Well, and God is teaching us slowly but surely to rest in Him and let Him do what He's already done. Let Him manifest what He's already done in the Lord Jesus on our behalf. Crucified, risen. One thing we want to keep in mind, too, is our motives. Often we find ourselves wanting the fruit of the Spirit and wanting these different aspects of the life of the Lord Jesus for our own benefit, for our own peace of heart and our own rest and our own... Uh, that we might be better Christians. People might think better of us and uh, things will be easier for us if our Christian life is going better. But uh, these motives are far, far from 
that which the Holy Spirit can honor. The Holy Spirit lives to honor the Lord Jesus and to manifest Him and to glorify God. And the Holy Spirit will work in our lives that God might be glorified, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ. So that that's something to think about too. That we hunger to grow for his sake, for Jesus' sake. That we're willing to be taken down to death for Jesus' sake. Not for our sake or anyone else else's sake but for Jesus' sake, that uh, he might be glorified and that uh, the Father might be glorified. Very important aspect. Well now, friends, it looks like our time is up. How the time flies when we're thinking of him, studying of him. Our Father, we Rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're learning not to have any confidence in the flesh. We thank thee for all that thou dost take us through in training us, teaching us to rely upon thee and thy truth. We trust thee to continue to make these truths crystal clear to our hearts and our minds, that we might rest in the word without effort simply resting upon what thou hast said, that, they, that thou wilt have more freedom to effortlessly uh, manifest thy truth in our lives, that in all things thou wilt be glorified, Father. We trust thee for these things now in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.